All right, thanks everyone. All right, we'll get started. We'll finish with our introductions. So I am Krista Schnell. I am currently a first year PhD, PhD student in sociology at UC Berkeley. Um, it's really exciting. I am currently studying, or my research interest is in um, data and technology in the workplace. And previous to this, I was working at Accenture uh, in the technology labs, which is their R&D department and innovation labs to you know, try and spur new ideas and new growth uh, within Accenture. And um, that's where I met Alex Cass, who is a PhD um, also, and he was a computer scientist trained in artificial intelligence, and he is interested in technology that makes people more effective. Um, he has over 25 years of experience. Were they all at Accenture? No, no. No. 10 years as a research scientist at Northwestern, and then I did the startup thing, because that's what everyone in computers oh. has to do at some point. Then I joined Accenture. Cool, see, I, I learned about Alex, too. Um, and he runs the Digital Workforce Innovation Initiative at the labs. And he is looking how to reimagine how individuals, teams, and organizations get work done. And what we're gonna be focusing on today is around their efforts uh, around the gig economy and how we can use online labor markets to improve the way work gets done uh, in large organizations. And we also have joining us Manish, um, he said hi really quickly, but um, he uh, is also in the same digital workforce initiative as Alex. He's gonna, gonna be helping us out today, answering any questions or you know, sparking conversations. And um, interestingly, I did not know this, but he, cre he created next generation of Disneyland theme park attraction, Turtle Talk with Crush. So Crush being the uh, turtle from Finding Nemo. Nemo yeah. Okay, thank God. I was like, I, I have to be right on my Disney movies. Um, so that is pretty cool. And um, just to give you guys a quick idea of what we'll be doing today. So we'll start with kind of um, an interview where I interview Alex and ask him about the gig economy, what Accenture is doing there. Um, we'll have some time for Q&A, but then we'd also like to spend the second half doing something more interactive with you guys. So obviously this is a new and like burgeoning field, and we would love to kind of see what you guys think are some of the opportunities and challenges, um, and in a sense kind of, you know, crowdsource or, you know, create a gig and a solution within our, this own little workshop. So, um, yeah, so let's launch into the interview. We want to steal your ideas as much as we want to tell you anything. Basically. basically. <laughs> um, awesome. So just to start out with, because I, I don't know, maybe or maybe you guys are not so familiar with the gig economy, but um, Alex, can you tell me, is it just <coughs> Airbnb and Uber, or is there anything else to this thing? No, it's, uh, the gig economy is not just Uber. Uh, I think let's start there. It's actually, it's, it's pretty exciting with regard to the diversity of things that I would categorize under that. I mean, we characterize the gig economy gen uh, generally at Accenture as the use of online labor markets um, to source labor on demand. And the interesting thing about it is the diversity of labor markets that are now emerging. So that, yes, there's Uber and there's Lyft and there's, there's kind of um, markets for labor that, you know, basically anyone that's a good driver can, can get work on there. But there's also vendors that are specializing in things like uh, solving data science problems, uh, doing software testing. You can go online and on uh, online labor markets, you can join a community if you have the right talent to do graphic design work, to do corporate strategy work, to do accounting. And there are some of these markets that are very general purpose. They're like a general freelancer sort of matchmaking service. And there are others that are very specialized to certain kinds of work. There are some where you sort of go online and you hi find a person and hire them. That's, I'd say, most of them. But there are other paradigms that are being, uh, becoming popular also where it's organized more as a contest and so forth. So there's a lot of different kinds of paradigms the, the overarching theme, though, is replacing traditional modes of hiring people for a job where they may have a variety of work to do, some of which they like and some of which they don't like, to a more sort of granular process of getting work through an online labor market, 
um, so, so that you provide to the organization, you provide a greater level of agility to sort of change their talent mix more quickly, and to the individual workers who are participating, you give more of a sense of self-direction and ability to sort of spend most of the time working on things that you are passionate about and less time working on stuff because it's just part of your job. Yeah. That's the basic theme across the spectrum of different kinds of work. Just to sort of put an explanation point on it's not just Uber, I was recently talking with one uh, crowd community building company. They have people who are doctors who are reading, who are doing basic, they're radiologists who are taking on gigs that involve interpreting um, uh, x-rays for research purposes. So something that might be too expensive for the research projects to actually hire radiologists who are very expensive to do. If they were trying to get them full time, these guys just do it in their spare time through this online labor market. So very specialized, high value work as well as very commoditized work. Awesome, um, that sounds awesome. And I'm curious, like how, how much is it actually being used though right now? Like why, why are we talking about the gig economy today sure. as opposed to before? Sure. Well, so, I mean, obviously everyone's familiar with Uber and just as an example, I mean, Uber is a good example only in the sense that it has completely disrupted an industry, obviously. It's total, turned it completely inside out and I think let, left the traditional model of doing work in that industry basically infeasible now. And so there's a question of to what extent will that spread? What, how, we think in Accenture where we do you know, high value consulting work, we do IT systems, we think it's gonna have as big an impact on that kind of work, the kind of work we do and the kind of work our uh, uh, clients do mm -hmm. as it has on that industry. But that's not for sure. There's still a lot to be explored about how to make it. It's not easy, once you get to more specialized kind of work, it's not easy to make that work. So, um, yeah, I mean, first of all, in terms of the, the size, it's big. To pick just uh, one example, Upwork, which is probably the largest freelancer market, they have 12 million registered uh, workers worldwide, 5 million registered customers, a billion dollars worth of work being brokered on that platform every year. So that, and that's just one yeah. of really dozens of these emerging platforms. So I think it's early days, but the early days are already quite big and worth paying attention to. Cool. So I know when I first joined Accenture, actually, um, you know, we don't always think of Accenture maybe maybe or maybe not as like a big player in this, but I remember when I first joined, I was like- We you don't? Know, <laughs> That's what I'm trying to change anyway. <laughs> um, awesome. Um, I was, yeah, so I was on the bench, like I wasn't on a consulting like gig at the time, but I was like a brand new grad with a mechanical engineering degree, like super, super pumped to be working for Accenture. And I'm just wondering like, would there, is there a way that you could have leveraged that or you know, that you can leverage? What, what is Accenture doing within their own community to make this possible? Sure, sure. So, I mean, the thing is, Accenture is a very large organization. I know a lot of people don't know, know, know about it, but it's about 370,000 people worldwide. Um, and so, and it's, a it's also a, a company that most of the work we do is serving other very large companies. So we're very interested in how do large organizations who already have a lot of employees, what is this, what is, what is this gig, what are these gig economy concepts, what are online labor markets gonna mean for them? The example you give, it, it's typical when you're in one of these large organizations, you, you, you're in a role, uh, Maybe, maybe you're between roles, right? And you don't know how to find your next role. Or maybe you're in a role and you're tired of it, you'd like to find the next role. Um, and I think the standard phrase that you may be familiar with is sort of the old boys network, right? The, the, the traditional approach has been, you sort of find work by knowing other people. It, you have a network. And some people are really good at networking and other people aren't. But even the ones that are really good at it you know, they, they'll only be able to find the people who they know, right? And, the, and they'll only be found by the people they know. So one of the things that we think, there's th at least two opportunities we see for Accenture and for our clients who are large organizations with online labor markets. One is rethinking how they organize their own employees, right? 
from a sort of rigid set of hierarchies where you know, a manager owns a set of people and everything they get done, they get done with that set of people. And you have to know people to know people to know people to find another team to join. Two, a much more fluid, we call liquid workforce approach, where you have online labor markets that operate inside the organization. So we think the gig economy is not just about little people who are literally freelancers, but also people who are employees adopting more of a, a kind of a freelancer mindset within their company and the company supporting it by, make, by putting the, the platforms in place to do this online brokering internally as well as the incentives and the culture change to sort of make that a feasible way to organize the workforce. And that hopefully will mean that I'll spend more time uh, doing work I love within the organization and I'll also have the best people for any given thing I need to do on my team. And, and, and so there's, I think, a value proposition to both the organization and to the employees. So what, one, one obvious thing for companies like Accenture is treating their own employees as a crowd and, and creating more gig work opportunities, build skills and so forth. The other opportunity is to use external workers in, 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 in combination with their employees. And I think that is kind of the new management skill that's going to be in demand is the ability to orchestrate teams that are formed on demand, that are a combination of people you might source. Maybe you have a small fixed team of people and you use that in combination with workers that you source from public talent markets and work, maybe workers you source from talent markets inside your organization, be able to put those people together and then use them effectively, I think is gonna require a whole new set of technologies and a whole new set of management skills and a whole new set of mindsets uh, for both management and the workers involved. Yeah, yeah, it sounds, it sounds pretty complicated, to be honest, um, but also really We rewarding. have to make it sound that way to justify our jobs. Oh, oh there you go, thanks, Alex. <laughs> but no, I, I don't think it is, it, it really is all yeah. that. I think there's a lot of, um, well, it, I don't think it's hard to understand. Sure, sure. I think it's going to be hard for us to get it right. There are a lot of changes that need to be made that are deep changes in our mindsets about work. And one example is just a lot of people, when they first start getting into this, they think, how do we incent workers to take on gigs? Okay. We, we found that that is the easiest part of the whole thing. When we, we've deployed a talent market within Accenture for people who are on the bench. And when something gets posted on that talent market, it's often within minutes that you get multiple people who are replying, okay? The challenging thing, though, might be, first of all, how do we get people who need work to remember and think about using this? And also, people who aren't on the bench, people who are on a team, how do we incent their managers to allow them to go do work for another manager you know, there's, there's that kind of, I own resources now in the organization. In the future, we need to move to a mindset, you don't think about it as I own resources. You should get as much credit if someone who you've been grooming does work for another manager as you do now. And that's not how it works in most organizations now. So there are, it's going to be hard to change, but I don't think it's really all that complicated. Yeah. Um, and actually, now that I'm thinking, one of the things you mentioned earlier was now with this new kind of system, maybe you know, you're not relying on like networks, uh, like an old boys network as much, which for me you know, would probably be a lot harder. But I'm wondering, is there still like inequality within using these online systems and like in the gig economy? And, and is Accenture thinking about that? And what are they doing to maybe address some of those challenges? <coughs> yeah. Let me talk about challenges a little more generally and, and, sure. and I'll get into that. Um, so I started to allude to some of that. I, I do think there's challenges. Every time I think about both opportunities and challenges with regard to these online labor markets, this way of doing things, you have to think it, about it from both sides at the same time. Any model that you're going to propose, you have to think about it. What's in it for the organization or the, per, the task owners who, who have the work that they want to get done to use this model, and also from the participants, the workers, the employees, whatever word we're going to use for them, the contributors, what's in it for them? And what are the challenges for each side too? So in terms of challenges, for, for the organizations, it, they are really getting an increased level of agility, but what they're giving up is it maybe some 
continuity and control, right? So if I'm going to use a public talent market to find someone who's going to write code for me, I'm going to start having concerns about security. I'm going to have concerns about are they going to steal my intellectual property? Are my clients going to like the fact that I'm going to use people? Is it going to dilute my brand? There are a lot of things that are challenges for the organization itself. Um, and we're working on those. And I, I don't have time to go into all the different kinds of solutions, but they're both sort of technology and pra work process solutions to those. The other thing, which I think you're alluding to, is what about the challenges from the employee perspective? There's a lot of opportunities we're talking about. You get to be more self-directed and so forth. You can work when you want to work, from where you want to work often in many of these models. But there's also risks, okay? I think one risk is just general kind of worker protections that are typically associated with the traditional employee model as people move to freelancer model, which I think a significant percentage of the workforce is, we're, we're hearing statistics like 42% of the workforce is going to be freelancers by 2020. That an increasing percentage of the workforce of young kids coming out of college are not interested in working for a big organization. They want to be more entrepreneurial. That probably means they're going to be in that freelance mode for a while. But a lot of our social safety net has been set up around the employment relationship, um, the pension, the health insurance. And right now we have two models of relationships really legally. We have the employee relationship and the contractor relationship. And that's probably too bipolar for the future. We're going to need to have a broader spectrum. So I think there's worker protection. And then there's also fairness issues. In, in some ways, some people make the argument, you know, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog, right? In some ways, you might expect it to be fairer because you're doing this work virtually. It's not relying on old boy network. It's relying on an automated network. And there's a lot of reasons to expect fairness. But there are also concerns we have. So recently, um, we got started to be concerned about issues related to gender equity in particular. Um, there's a, there's a, a group that is at our lab that's been thinking about gender equity issues in the traditional employment model, the pay gap, which you're probably all familiar with. And the question is, is that going to get better or worse in the gig economy? So let's think about the, the process that you use a typical gig economy workflow. It starts with someone posting a job. Then once people post the job, some, a, a group of people will respond to that job post. Those people that respond who are candidates now get vetted. And this all has to happen pretty quickly. So post, respond, vet, and then negotiate pay rate. It turns out that each of those places are places where gender inequity can creep in. So I, didn't, I hadn't really thought about this until we started looking at it closely. But there are studies that show that even just the job post itself, if you aren't careful about how you make a job post, you often will, there will be unconscious gender bias in the job post itself and you may fail to attract qualified women at the same rate that you're gonna uh, attract qualified men. For example, if you put in a lot of nice to have requirements for the job, it turns out a lot of men will just say, well, I don't have that, but I've got most of everything else, so I'll be fine. Whereas a higher percentage of women will be saying, I gotta have every single one of these or I'm not even applying. So you're biasing the job post and you're losing good candidates. So we've developed some technology that actually scan your job posts and help you produce better, more um, gender neutral job posts. There's other things that go on, like for instance, when candidates are vetted, oftentimes diverse candidates are vetted unconsciously, they're forced to prove themselves in a way that it's just taken for granted for other candidates. So we've come up with a, a process that's again, automatically puts all the candidates through the same vetting. And then finally, in terms of negotiated pay rate, I'll, I'll just touch on that. Um, turns out that different groups negotiate more aggressively. Some women tend perhaps to not negotiate for pay as aggressively as men. And in traditional jobs, that may hurt them, but you, know, you only negotiate every now and then. In the gig economy, you're negotiating for every gig. It might be several times a week. And so we really want to make sure that we do everything we can to make that as equal as possible. So what we've been focused on there is providing transparency to both the hiring manager and the candidates about what is the going rate for the kind of work 
that's described in this task with people with the profile that this particular worker has. So at least there are objective standards, and there's, I think, some studies that show that this gap in how aggressively negotiation happens is reduced when there are some objective statistics to, 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 to base it on. So this is the kind of thing we've been looking at, is, is how do we, first of all, uh, in terms of thinking about new models of the relationship between employees and employer, how do we make sure that it's fair to workers and that they get the benefits without, you know, without it being too disruptive to their protections? And then in terms of fairness also, how do we, how do we make sure that works as well? Awesome. Yeah, I love hearing those stories, and especially from Accenture, where I still love you guys. Um, I, I should mention, <laughs> I, I, just because just people who watch the video from Accenture will kill me if I don't mention this, that, that this, hack the, this, this pay gap technology been working on. We, did, we participated in Hack the Pay Gap program mm -hmm. and presented this at the White House fairly recently. Yeah. The Secretary of Commerce was there. It was a really fun mm -hmm. aspect of the whole thing is trying to participate in the national conversation about how are we going to change the way work gets done in a way that's fair across gender, race, other, other, other boundaries. Yeah, super cool. Thank you. Um, so that's kind of um, what we want to give as a, an overview of the gig economy, some things that Accenture is doing, but we'd also um, love to hear from you if you guys have um, any questions. And um, I would say totally, Alex is like one of the most uh, critical minds I think that I've come across in the lab. So he's totally thinks like a researcher. So like, give him some tough questions. Yeah, let's start the conversation. <laughs> yep. Oh, you want to do I the... Know, I, uh, I mean, and Manish, if you have, you should feel free to participate too. You want to say it and then I can just repeat it, maybe? I, I should mention that Manish is the guy who actually makes most of this happen in our lab. I, I, I sort of am the, uh, the front man for the band, but he's the one that plays the lead guitar. So he answers, he should an, you, should get, you should definitely feel free to jump in with questions and answers and so forth. Uh, I don't know, start in the front and then. Yeah, so this, I, I should start by saying that I'm a technology guy, and so I have a few ideas, but not my area of expertise. I think there are uh, people that are working on this, though. I, I, I think in very vague terms what I'll say is I think the current, I, I sort, of, sort of alluded to this, but just to expand on it a little bit, I think the current model that we have where um, it's really a bipolar, you're either an employee or you're, you have just a, a very transient relationship with, with a company. I think that both mindset needs to change about that and also probably legal things need to change. And I, I don't know how much of it will be done through legal changes and how much will be done with mindset. But just to give you an example, we're, we're currently focused on how can we create Accenture has a lot of employees, but we also have a lot of alumni, a lot of people who we interviewed who we may have thought would be good employees, but for one reason never actually joined. So we have a, there's a large community of people that Accenture has an association with who are not actually employees. How, and, and our clients are in the same situation, how can we turn that into a broader community that may have some commitment to us and that we may have some commitment to that goes beyond um, what you might just have with a casual contractor in terms of commitment, in terms of number of hours of work and so forth. And then from a legal perspective, I, I think there's going to have to be a shift to some way that, you know, that there's, there's sort of prorated benefits for people that work as, as contractors and so forth. And some, some way to get out, uh, this is where I'm really get, like, getting out of my area of expertise, to be honest, but, but some way where people who are in the gig economy long term, um, they have a relationship that's characterized as being somewhat more like an employee relationship, even though it may be across a whole lot of different employees. So it's not going to be like a marriage where you, you have, you know, I owe you uh, full, full boat health insurance but perhaps all the people you work with contribute to your health insurance in some ways, th things like that. Awesome. Yeah. Best I can do for now. So I'm constantly in the position of uh, creating the companies on a team scale and we're trying to see the culture of steering around the direction. And we've heard everything from, you know, the culture is the most important thing to get that right, everything else follows. In fact, I really like the idea of and understand. And I also hear this gig economy Birthday or character talk or anything like that. And so, like, are these are 
Right, right. No, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, and I'll be honest with you that that's something we are struggling with right now is how to get that balance right. So to get to a level of, of depth one step beyond sort of the, the gig economy and it's cool and we're, we're exploring it, the, the model that makes the most sense to us is what we actually call the hybrid model. So most, most projects, for instance, or most programs that, that an organization would carry out, I think that a manager who's responsible for that is gonna use a hybrid of a, few, a very small number of people that he or she has with them throughout the entire program as, as, to the extent possible, where the emphasis with those people are maximum continuity, they are kind of the corporate memory, they own the, they own the responsibility for context. Then there's gonna be a middle group who may be employees of the company, so they are trained in the culture, trained in the basic terminology, methodology, they are also about context, but a little bit less focus on continuity. They may come and go as frequently as we might think of, uh, you know, an Uber driver coming and going. On, you know, their, their typical duration with the team might be uh, somewhere between half a day to a couple of weeks. They come and go, and then there will be people who you have from external talent sources that where the emphasis with them is on specialized skill and knowledge that you don't have within your your company. So that's what I think we're starting to see emerge is a new practice of orchestration where what you need to understand is what kinds of roles and work do I place a premium on continuity? Where do it is maybe not continuity, but I do need context and where is it I need specialized skills and context is less important, right? So if I'm, if I'm bringing in, let's say in my area of IT, the architect probably needs to know the architectural patterns that my company likes to use. So they probably need to be a context person, maybe not continuity, but context. They probably are gonna be an employee. But the people who are doing that exotic technology that I need to add that I don't use on most of my projects, they're probably gonna come from outside, fly in, do their thing, fly out. The other thing I'll say is, and I don't see this happening yet, so I'm, I'm, I'm thin ice here, but here's what I think is gonna happen, is there are gonna be a lot of relationships that are kind of like uh, uh, long-term gig economy relationships where the person is not an employee, he, can, he or she can work for other companies, maybe even including my competitors, but I use them on a frequent basis. So we get to know each other. They're not just strangers who helicopter in, do something, and helicopter out. I get to know what they're good at, they get to know what I need, and there is a cultural sharing. It's, it would sort of be like a frequent visitor to your house, right? If you have someone who comes frequently, they know what kinds of things, what, what table manners you like to have at your table and so forth, and they don't live there. They only come when it makes sense for you and it makes sense for them, but they do know you. Okay, I'm just gonna, I, we don't, if we're gonna get to our interactive exercise, <laughs> not gonna be able to take that many more questions, so I think uh, maybe just one, one, or two more? one or two more. I, I think you've had great questions so far, yeah. so I also don't wanna stop that sure, from happening. Sure. And I'll be happy to be around after for more questions. Sure. Yeah. Awesome, I don't know how to choose. Um, Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I feel like I should be choosing and I did see, I did see a hand back there like way before, but I, I want to get to this side of the room. So go for it. Um, I, I understand even why employees are interested in moving to a, a gig economy and maybe some of it, but I'm interested in particularly why large organizations are motivated to participate. I mean, they, they seem to have all the interest in loyalty Yeah. Yeah. Well, both. So we're, 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 we think there's a role for both. Okay. And and the and, and and the reasons have to do with broadly speaking, I would say agility. Okay. I the old way of working with fixed teams of resources in rigid hierarchies was great when the world moved slowly. 
and I had to change my talent mix every five years. If I have to change my talent mix every five weeks, which I think is what we're getting closer to, I need to have some ability of elasticity. I need to be able to maybe move people around within my organization more fluidly. And I also need to go out for specialized skills that um, I, don't, I don't have in-house. That's why I think, I think there is a value proposition that's quite important for, for both. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I haven't mastered that lingo yet. So. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. so it's not necessarily uh, a bottom line conversation. Well, it can be. I mean, I, I can only speak for Accenture. So Accenture has uh, uh, people around the world already. So we're not looking, for instance, uh, to find people who are in places where the wages are lower, anything like that. But there are specialized skills that we just, even as big as we are, you know, we have to bulk up on the things we do a lot of. And every project also has some things we don't do a lot of, and we want to get the best talent at the moment for, for those things as well. Awesome. Great. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll add one, one thing here that maybe we should go on, which is, again, back to, I think, both, what both of you are talking about. When we first started working in this area, we thought, when you go to external talent, they come in, they do their thing, they leave. And so you're, you're getting the work done that you don't have the people in-house right now to do. But we found, and Manish, Manish has really been pioneering this aspect, is now, when we think about it, the, the experiments have shown us that um, there's also a really great opportunity for knowledge transfer, okay? And that, that when you go and you find a specialized expert, yeah, the cheapest thing you could do for that project is have him come in, do the work, and leave. But long-term, the biggest benefit might be for you to have them come in, have them apprentice someone that's on your team to do the work. It may take them a little bit longer. It may cost you a little bit more. But then when they leave, you have the, the talent and the skills has been transferred as well. And so we're... Well, you're paying them. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So, so there's a bunch of we haven't found that to be a problem. I'll say just empirically, I think there are a bunch of things that really motivate the people who are on these gig work things. One is, they actually like to share their expertise and they like to build their digital reputation. So part of what you are giving them is you're paying them, okay? But one of the things we found is they're every bit as motivated. There's a, there's a ladder they're climbing as much as in the corporate world that maybe even is more prominent in their mind. They're entrepreneurs, right? And the fact that you're gonna give them a reputation, you're gonna give them a, a review and that it's gonna be in depth and talk about what they've been, that they're able to teach this skill as well as to do it, that positions them to get a higher pay later on. Sorry. Oh, he was saying you could actually do that immediately, like ask for more money to teach. Yeah, right away. Yeah, and, and, we, and you generally do have to pay more if you're going to get that. Yeah. All right. Should cool. we do the exercise, and we could take questions in a little bit then? Yeah. How many? Just how many more people were, had their hands raised? Okay, yeah, maybe just, okay, that's, can we just take <laughs> the one? I hate to cut off questions because yeah. they're so educational, but. I know, I mean, I, and this is also, I mean, as a, um, in the being responsive, Let, let's do one more. Um, we can also, yeah, yeah, I would she love to. She seemed like she was really waiting for a long time. Cool, yeah, no, I'd love to hear your question. Uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to discuss with you afterwards. Sure. What's the middleware for society of everybody working gigs um, in terms of social benefits?
I think long term. Oh, sure. So th I think if I understood it, there, there was a couple of parts, but the, the, the last part, which is what I'll focus on first, is um, we, we have this notion that we talked about about the, the gig worker coming in and transferring knowledge in. Is there also a concern about knowledge getting transferred out? And so I think you have to divide that into two pieces. There's specific IP that you may have that you don't want to share publicly and that there, there's absolutely, that's an immediate concern and that's a concern with your employees as well and Accenture, like all companies, employees leave and they, they, they you, you have to deal with that through uh, a, a level of trust, a level of legal, legal protection, there are non-disclosure agreements or, and, and things like that that are feasible in this, in this mode as well. Long term though, the issue of, uh, it's not some specific IP or trade secret, but just you're, you're spreading your skills out and your people are learning to do what you do. Um, that's not a short-term concern because this just isn't a big enough part of the, we still have a lot that sort of lives in our corporate culture and processes that people don't take with them when they leave. And, but I think long-term, as this grows and becomes a larger part, that, that will be a, a, a question that we'll need to deal with is, what does it mean to maintain your unique identity as a company if you're making heavy use of people who are very transient? And I, I think there are good answers to that, and they have to do with that hybrid approach, but we'll have to talk about it offline and get into it, and it's certainly not a solved problem. Awesome. We'll take this moment to transition. We don't have as much time as maybe. Sorry. No, that's okay. I thought it was awesome conversation. Um, but I'm just, I would like to get some ideas from you guys and we can put up this on the board, but the idea is we'll gather some, some of the best opportunities, some of the best, um, biggest challenges maybe that you guys see and then work in small groups together to kind of solve, solve, a, solve an opportunity, solve a challenge um, and then kind of come back and, and really briefly um, talk to the rest of the group about what you guys discuss in your smaller groups. Um, so with that, does anyone have like a really like, oh, this is like my best idea for opportunity in, this, in the gig economy or uh, this is the biggest challenge I see? I know we've discussed this a bit, but how would it apply? How would it apply your organization or, yeah. you know, your client's organization, something like that? Yeah, how do we measure contributions in a flexible workforce? Yep. Green and red. Yeah. So my question is about curation. You mentioned the large volume of these independent people moving through systems, right? But as a business, you're not looking, there might be a thousand contractors for this particular skill set, but you're not looking for a thousand, you want one. Right, and how do you slice that in a way that's meaningful? Is like a star rating really makes sense in fields like design? It's a great one. It happens to be something we've been working on in terms of like, can talk to you after. Anyone else? Carol? I don't know. You might have to come up here. Uh, sure. So you talked about kind of um, needing to develop different types of management skills. Like one concern I would have is that you're still at least if I'm understanding it correctly, that you're still relying on the intelligence of the managers, kind of the people in the hierarchy to determine kind of what tasks need to be done and all that kind of stuff so that the, the strategic kind of mind share still stays there. Like, what do you do with that? It's really interesting. I, want, I might think about solutions where the gig workers themselves self-organize, things like that, right? That'd be an interesting thing to see if you can work out in the next few minutes to start. Anyone else? Oh, one more. Yep. Maybe take a couple more and then we'll just kind of... Yeah, and then maybe we can just, them. yeah. Remember, you're going to have to work on the solutions to these. Yeah, so... <laughs> so I guess I'd like to dig into a, a little bit of a question that was raised 
earlier about figuring out the relative level of investment for a team or a budget um, or, or an organization and sort of growing talent from within and kind of investing in that long-term core or people within the organization versus external talent, because I think it's something that you, know, you said you're still working on, and we certainly, for any project, have that decision that's a hard one to make. Yeah. OK, cool. Yeah, come on up. Let's do these two, and then we'll, we'll move to the next. Yeah, I don't know if it fits the format, but I'm interested in this idea of like unbundling the agency model. Like, How can you do great work where there's no central entity where people come in joining in? Right. Yeah, for like creative work yeah. where you have a designer and developer, a business consultant, whatever it would be, like Accenture does as well. Yeah. How do you do these teams where there's no central organizer? Thanks. I'm interested to understand how you can create a culture of learning, how you can create a culture of continuous improvement when your workforce is peeling off all the time. I feel like it might be easiest to do a show of hands vote instead of having people sure. come up to see kind of what we want to tackle here specifically. So I'm happy after the session <laughs> to talk with anyone that wants to continue on about any ideas I may have, but we're, we're going to try to get you guys to actually work on these problems, a couple of them at least, for the next few minutes. Right. Great. Yeah. So um, I'm going to read them back real fast. Keep in mind the number that you that you prefer to discuss in small groups. So one, how, sort of how do you co measure contribution? How about I'll count it. Two, how do you find the right skilled people? Three, how do you organize or manage crowd workers? Four, investing in growing your own talent versus externally. Uh, five, how do you do great work without a central organization? And six, how do you create a culture of continuous learning? Those are awesome questions. So if you have um, everyone vote for two? Sure, vote for two, you get two votes. So pick your top two, vote, and then we'll divide into two groups and work on the top. Awesome, okay. Four three. Voting for number one. One, two, three, four, okay. Raise your hands high. Um, how about number two? One, two, three, four, six, I think. Six, six yeah. Awesome. Number three? Four? Uh, and then number four? One, two, three, four, five, four. 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 Remember, you get to vote for two. Um, number five? Six. Six. Yep. And then number six? Awesome. Like everyone. Lots. Awesome, so it looks like number one and number six. Um, oh, but actually we're only choosing one. So how do you create a culture of continuous learning? Um, so we have is the question, do you want to do it? Groups. Should we do two groups or three? Oh, I guess, so. yeah, we could, or I don't know, I was thinking smaller groups. Two groups, uh, so, th so three groups, four groups? Three, three or you do four. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we could, we could actually do six groups um, if that's what, you guys want to do. <laughs> um, this is hard. Um, <laughs> let, let, why, don't, why don't we say four? four? If we get four, we'll get, we get, I think we get the right size group because we won't have time to actually even four, present so the maybe, results. So four, and do you actually want to choose the top four? I mean, yeah. Uh, so or do you want to just... I think the ones who yeah. step circle. The okay. Awesome. So... Sure. <laughs> if you can make that work. <laughs> Um, you're gonna okay. A, you're going to be a gig worker between the groups. Eh? So All I'm just right. going to assign it. But um, sort of like right up here, um, we'll have you guys tackle number one, a small group in the upper here. Um, kind of back to my left, um, you guys will work on number two, and then back to the right, um, number five, and then um, up close in the front, number six. Um, so I guess. Go to what you want to talk to, or what you want to so, talk so about, but try and split up evenly. We're going to float between 
And then I think the goal is, at how much time do they have? Uh, you have very little time. <laughs> oh, um, a good minutes. five, yeah. So, okay, so, so take two, about five minutes. And then we'll present. Come up with some five ideas minutes. and then appoint someone who will come back and present the, the thoughts on it. Awesome. Think about who's going to present at the end as well. All right, thank you guys very much for participating and attending. Talk to Alex afterwards if you want to know more. Yeah, I'm going to stick around, so anyone who wants to follow up, come on by.